dann. The light's on, it's muted. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everyone to today's uh, meeting of the Portland Children's Levy. I'm City Commissioner and Allocation Chair, Dan Saltzman. And before we begin, I'd like to introduce the other members of the Allocation Committee. On my far right is Alyssa Kinney-Geyer, the City of Portland representative. On my immediate right is Adrian Livingston, appointed by Multnomah County. And on my far left is Ron Belts, representing the Portland Business Alliance. And uh, Multnomah County Commissioner Deborah Kafori, I believe, will be joining us shortly. Uh, next, we have the levy staff, uh, Program Director Lisa Pellegrino, who is in charge of after school and mentoring programs as well. Lisa Hansel, who oversees foster care and child abuse prevention and intervention programs. Communication Director Mary Gay Broderick. Fiscal Specialist John Kelly. And Assistant Director and Early Childhood Lead, uh, Meg McElroy, is not with us today. Since it's been a while since we met, uh, I'd like to start off by providing some comments about the levy. Uh, back in 2002, city residents created the Portland Children's Levy, which was overwhelmingly renewed by voters again in 2008. The levy annually provides more than $12 million to support organizations reaching 16,000 children and their families through programs in early childhood, after school and mentoring, child abuse prevention and intervention, and helping children in foster care succeed. The levy operates with a 5% administrative cap so that 95 cents of every dollar goes directly to proven programs that achieve positive results for children. Since the levy's renewal two years ago, the Allocation Committee has invested more than $36 million in programs through three-year contracts that run through uh, June of 2012. We have, also, we have also increased the result reach of our support by continuing with the Leverage Fund, which matches public dollars with private dollars to make more resources available for Portland's children. Last spring, nine organizations received $2.5 million in Leverage Fund Challenge Grant investments, where organizations had to secure financial support from other community partners. We're excited that those programs should be getting off the ground in the next few months. In addition to the Challenge Grants, we set aside $500,000 from the Leverage Fund for collaboration grants, and we'll be hearing more about that today on our agenda. So we'll begin here today with uh, today's business by first asking for approval of our minutes of our June 4th meeting. I move we approve the minutes. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. The minutes have been approved, and then we will start. Uh, next up is the public comment period. We do this at every meeting. Uh, anybody who wishes to speak to us uh, may have to three minutes to do so. Is there anybody who wishes to speak to us on any topic? Okay, seeing nobody, we will move on. And, uh, and our first agenda item is a financial update of the 2009-2010 fiscal year that ended on June 30th. Uh, John Kelly, you have the floor. Good morning. Good morning. So this green piece of paper, which you all have in your packets and is available for folks in the audience, is what I'm going to be working off of. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you look at the numbers, there's one side has numbers. The other side has sort of narrative. That is the information that's going to appear in our annual report, which will be coming out in a few months. So that is a summary of how we did last year. And I, if you want to look at that, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, comment on it a little bit. So this is information for the period July 1, 2009 through June 30, 2010. That's our fiscal year. Ended a few months ago. It takes a little while to sort things out. 
the year is closed as far as the city is concerned. So those are our final numbers from the city accounting system. We get audited independent of the city's audit every year, our auditors are McDonald Jacobs, and that audit begins October 26th, the field work. So it takes a few days of field work, and then usually a couple months. Probably in January, we'll have them appear and say, here's what we found. By my looking at the numbers, so this is unaudited, this is my look at the numbers, uh, our revenues exceeded the projections of the city economists by 4.2%. So we love the city economist. He is always conservative, and it's great to, we, every year that I've worked here, which is four years now, we've had more money come in than was projected, and you, that total is about $500,000. The big number that uh, Commissioner Saltzman alluded to earlier is our administ administrative expenditures as a percentage of revenue. They cannot exceed 5%. This year they were 4.5%, so well within, comfortably within that camp cap. And we've always been there. Uh, as a percentage of budget, uh, we were under budget on administrative expenditures by 3.3%, just about $21,000 under. Of the grants that we had out uh, last year, there were 74 grants out. Spending was about 95%. The way our grants work is they are cost reimbursement. So folks spend the money on their personnel and their programs, and then they submit invoices to us and say, here's what we spent, and we run that through city accounting, and they get paid. They cannot exceed their budgets, but this year they were 95% of their budgets. One of the reasons for that is this is the first year of a lot of these grants. Many are continuing, but several are new, and it takes a little while to get up to speed, and so uh, they don't always spend out fully. That's historically pretty typical for us, 95%. Is a, is a very typical uh, spending pattern. So I'm open to questions. I didn't, I didn't read through all those numbers. If, if you want me to, I'm sure happy to. But uh, the good news is revenues were higher than projected. Expenses were lower than projected. You'll see that last, maybe one number to, to point to for a moment is on the, on the column numbers, second from the bottom, encumbered funds, $6.1 million, $6.196. That's the money that the fund balance, we call it in accounting, it's the money that's left. That money is mostly committed either to leverage fund in the future, to the extension of the grants that we made the three -year grants on a five year levy. Um, we're in the process of looking at how much of that is, is uncommitted. So it's, it's not a simple process to look at what's what got spent, what we've already said we're going to spend, but we're going to have a report on that in the near future. The other important thing to know that affects our revenues is compression, and there are, I think, some ballot measures on the November ballot that could affect our revenues. And so we'll, get, we'll probably get a new revenue projection from the city economists, probably January is typical, knowing whether our revenues may go down, our projections may go down a little bit uh, if, if a few things are passed on the ballot. But... Uh, that's unknown at this time. Any questions on these numbers or anything I've said? So the revenues for the fiscal year ended June 30th were about 13.7 million. Yes. Program investments were about 12.4 million. Administration was 622,000, which was 4.5%. 4, 4. Yes. Okay. And that's 3.3% lower than projected the administration expected. yes we set a budget and we didn't spend to budget right any questions no i just want to compliment the staff on running such a tight ship this is good news in a bad economy All right thank you um before you go i think uh maybe in the next meeting um, i'd like to have i'd like to have you calculate how much money have we've invested since we've been in existence uh, in 2003. What's the total amount of money that we've invested in these programs? Sure, I can do but, that. It'd take me a few minutes. Oh, you can do that in a few minutes? Oh. Well, I'm okay. here on my desk. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll give, you, we'll give you until next meeting. Okay, thank but you. I think that'd be an interesting number for us all to hear. Thanks, John. So our next uh, item is the uh, next up is Lisa Pellegrino, who will take us through the proposed bylaw revisions. Uh, our bylaws have not been revised since the levy's inception many years ago, and staff has noted a number of areas that need to be modified or changed. So, Lisa, take it away. 
Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all again after our not-so-summery summer. <clears throat> um, we have been meaning to clean up these bylaws for many a month, um, but as the last two years are pretty much, we went back and looked at the meetings for the last two years, and every single one was spent on funding. So for two years, we've done nothing but talk about funding, pretty much. Um, so, so now we have a minute right now to uh, take a step back and take care of some business um, that needs uh, taken care of, one of which is the bylaws. So, um, so I thought I would run through what was going to change in the bylaws, and if you have any questions about that, just stop me as I'm going. Um, because this is, and I think I gave, I sent you a set of the old and the new, so you could look at the both and compare them. Um, so the first thing is uh, on sort of in um, the, I guess it's purpose and powers, Article Two on the new bylaws. Um, so that was just put in there to clarify um, and spell out some detail um, and to reference the ballot language specifically that that's what authorizes our existence. Um, that just that language was just missing on the on the first set. Um, the second point around membership um, that we wanted to change, which just clarifies um, who selects you all to sit right here, um, and um, and the appointment, and, and sort of approves those appointments, and um, and assures that those um, those things are transmitted in writing, um, as well as uh, adding the requirement that all of you must either live or work in the city of Portland to sit on the committee. Um, Why don't you just describe the composition and who appoints who for sure. you know, our um, listening audience and viewing audience? So the allocation committee is set in the bylaws to have five members. Um, the first member is um, an elected um, member of the Portland City Council, and the Portland City Council appoints that le elected member. Um, second is the Multnomah County Commission, and they appoint an elected from their body to sit on this, and that's Deborah Cafori uh, currently. Uh, the Portland Business Alliance um, appoints one of its members to sit here, and that's Ron Belts. Uh, the City Council appoints a citizen representative, so not an elected, um, and that is Alyssa Kenny Geyer. The county board also selects a citizen representative, so again, not an elected official, um, and that's Adrian Livingston. So um, this, th w there's really nothing in this article that's different than what we're, we've done. It just spells out what happens because it was kind of it was just more general language. Um, and although we have observed that, when, re oh, go ahead. when they when I was put on, there was some confusion about who actually did it. So I appreciate you clarifying this. Language. That was kind of the idea because it is confusing. Every time, we have it, every time we have somebody leaving, it was confusion about what exactly needed to get done. So we did follow these rules and these appointments, but we didn't really, they weren't spelled out. Um, same with the live and work. Everyone who's been on this board either lived or worked in Portland, but, but we thought that we should, it should be memorialized in the bylaws since these dollars must serve the residents of the city of Portland. Um, okay, next, um, for the chair of the committee, we inserted a provision that would... Um, provide for this committee electing a chair um, every two years. Um, it used, the old provision was for a rotating chair. Um, we thought electing a chair just made more sense. Um, that way the group can come together and every couple of years, and most people are sitting for two years. The, the terms are two years anyway, so most people are on for two years, um, can come and elect a chair. Um, next, this, on this sort of on that second page, which is Article 4, term. Um, this stuff wasn't really, it was just spelled out that there would be a two-year term in the old bylaws. Um, what we did here was clarify exactly the process for doing the appointments, which again has been a piece of, a little bit piece of a confusion in the past. So <clears throat> basically at the end of the two-year, or three months prior to the end of a two-year term, we would, the staff would notify the appointing body in writing that the appointment is going to terminate on a certain date and that that appointing body needs to either reappoint the person that's currently sitting or select a new person. Um, and then go through its internal process to do that approval. So then once the appointing body, so say the county commission, for instance, has gone through that process to appoint Deborah, they notify us in writing that that's happened so, um, so that we have a good paper trail for how that all occurred and we know that the appointing body has actually done their review of the person and wants to select them. If we um, want to make comments, should we do it at the point that you're Yes, yeah, go right ahead. It? Okay, so... Um, I think this is great, and I think it's great that you actually clarified the timing on that in terms of the three months. But I also wonder if it's a good idea to give a deadline to that appointing body to get word back to you. In other words, a month or two months before the actual before the actual rotates, rotates, so that you can give them a deadline. You know, you, we're giving you three months um, before the new person has to take the seat. We'd like to know in one month or two months. I guess it was my assumption that the deadline was the expiration of the old person's term. 
so I was guess giving them three months to get their act together. It takes okay. sometimes a while for appointing, but you know they have to have a meeting. Somebody has to appoint. They have to go review it. And I mean, it's not always a quick thing, mm -hmm. um, turnaround. So to my mind, it was okay if it's let's just say it's June 30. If it was on the fiscal year, that they would and I notified them at the quarter mark that they would have that three months okay. to get their shop in order, um, with probably a reminder from me, you know, a month before the end. Okay. Did you would you rather it be sooner? I mean, I just it's, figured it, we it's needed up to, to see if person. you can wait to the last minute like that and that, and. You can live with that. That's well. Fine. We gotta. Um, I'll check back with them. Yeah, but um, that's fine. If, if that works, that's fine. Okay. I have a question. Then. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when the business alliance appointed me, one of the reasons I was appointed is we were under the impression that you had to be a city of Portland resident. So <clears throat> there were a number of business people that were out of the city. So I was one of the few, I guess, that was a city of Portland resident. So I. I guess to me it's important that since it's taxpayer money, it is a city of Portland resident, not just working in the city of Portland. And if it wasn't clarified before, we could at least have it if, you know, some of us are not residents now, but maybe the next time that people are appointed that that be one of the requirements that you actually are a city of Portland resident since we're deciding on taxpayer money. Well, again, I wouldn't say staff has a position on it. I would say that's up to you all. Um, so if you want to make a motion and... And change because we we change we put the requirement in the beginning um, so in under Article Three members in the front it says um, uh, one uh, oh wait I'm sorry no it must be where is it hang on a second let me find the place it's Article on. Three Section One Composition Composition sorry I was looking at the old bylaws um, the last sentence in there all allocation committee members shall reside or work in the city of Portland okay so that's the standard that we were into. Um, if you all want to, and again, it was not formalized or written down in the first set of bylaws. There was not a standard written in there. So I think it's, if you want to make a change, then you should offer that change up to the group and see if people support that. I can understand the point. Um, however, I think that there might be something lost because, for my, for example, myself, I actually don't live in the city of Portland, but part of that was because I couldn't afford to stay in the city of Portland. I'm from Portland. I do work right in North Northeast. My life is in Portland. And so, you know, I would definitely want to have a dis full discussion because there have been different um, circumstances that have really forced people to move outside of Portland but still really focus and stay in Portland. And so for me, this is where I live and I breathe and I really want to make sure I am impacting my own community. So I would really want that to be a full discussion because I think that there might be something lost if we just say reside in, you know, but because I've lived in Portland, um, gosh, all but three years, and yet I've been working in Portland for the, the entirety of the time that I've been in Oregon, so, or Portland. Well, and that's why I was saying mm -hmm. if we had it for the next batch that came in, and, and I understand right. what you're saying, but the same thing we could make a point for Dan and Deborah is that maybe they couldn't afford to live in the city, but they should still be able to be elected by the city or the county, but that's not the case. They have to be city of Portland or city of, or county of Multnomah residents to be able to run for office. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I, I supported the live or work because I believe that's um, the way we do it with a lot of the city appointed bodies. I mean, we could do some further homework on that, but I believe that's sort of how it works for other appointed bodies, Planning Commission, Portland Development Commission. Sorry. That could be. I don't. I can't say as I know off the top of my head. I didn't really I research either, that. But I think that's generally been the rule. I, I think that would be helpful to make making a decision for me is to know what's consistent with other policies. But I, I do think that this is somewhat different because it is. Well, no, I guess it's not than the other than the other. So I, I would like to go back and look to it, Multnomah County, because I think our ours is live in. But I don't know. I'd have what to types of commissions and things are you thinking of? Because that would be helping, helpful for us if we're going to go out and research. What, what sorts of bodies that would you want to compare yourselves to? Do so you think the Portland Development Commission, for instance? I, I think it um, would be so one where you're deciding on taxpayers, how, how you spend taxpayers' money. Okay, so boards or commissions that decide on how to spend taxpayer dollars? Yes. There aren't that many of them. Because it's mostly electeds who do that. But. Okay. Well, I think PDC would be one example. That's the, that's the one example that's jumping to my mind. Most other Portland types of commission. commissions are advisory. 
Well, I'll, I'll just say I'm personally torn on this. You know, I tend to move toward flexibility so that we can get the best people, and I would hate to lose someone like Adrian. although I recognize you're not talking about her in particular. You're talking about grandfathering her in, but she's an example of, you know, what, what we might not have been able to put on. On the other hand, I also resonate with your point, you know, being a taxpayer for this particular levy myself, you know, I think just adds another layer of credibility of we're really being careful of how we spend those funds. So I, I think it would help me also to be consistent with how other committees work. Uh, but I do think that the Port, um, Multnomah Commission on Children is live or work in Multnomah County because I can think of at least one person that lives in Vancouver that's on that committee. But I, I like the Commission on Children and Families? Mm -hmm. Commission on Children and Families that mm -hmm. does decide taxpayer money, although a lot of it's state money. But even in that case, she doesn't live in the state. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it would be helpful to know. I think I, I personally can go either way on this. Okay, well, why don't we have uh, ask staff to do a little more research. Sure. And we can revisit this at our, I guess our next meeting. Yeah, there are next meetings in December. So we could revisit that particular point. Maybe it will, let's maybe we get through the rest <coughs> of the bylaws. If folks are in agreement on the other changes, maybe we'll just hold that one in abeyance and vote on the rest. If they're not, then if we've got a whole set of things, then we'll just take it up again. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry. Go, so that sort of went back to the composition. I'm actually on Article Four, um, which is the term. I think you covered that. And so we're um, on Article, Article Five now. Yes, I just wanted to make sure that there were no questions in Article Four because Ron brought up this question in relationship to Article Four. But I, w I don't know if there's any other questions about the term. One thing, just to note, because now everyone here, with the exception of Deborah, is sort of. We would, my guess is we would be going through this reappointment process with all of you um, as soon as we pass the bylaws because um, it needs to get done. Um, it wasn't really clarified before about what that, so that. So we would be following these rules with regard to everyone sitting except for Deborah who was just appointed in spring um, with everybody. And, uh, that actually raises another question for me. Are you thinking of staggering terms every other year or you're thinking we would all be on the same cycle? Well, I, I don't know that it's as important because there's been a tendency to reappoint. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, again, with, if, you, if you allow people to be reappointed, I mean, I, I don't know that it matters, um, you know, whether you stagger or not, because there's no guarantee what your changeover will be yeah. based on what the appointing body wants to do. You know? Theoretically, everyone could change it once, but it's unlikely. True. It's possible, but not likely. So exactly. right now so. you're thinking is you would do it every two years, everyone at the same time. Um, well, I mean, Deborah's term has been set because so she came in at a certain time, so hers would be keyed to her certain time. You guys are past your time right. and, and, hasn't, and haven't been formally reappointed, so I would just undertake to do that as soon as possible right. once we pass these so bylaws. So you would use our starting um, date as our... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would at least as the date, as the effective date, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know more questions about that provision. That one's otherwise clear? Okay. Um, so the next new provision just adds some specifications about appointing subcommittees and advisory groups. Um, the original bylaws didn't require formal authorization of subcommittees and advisory groups, so we just, this just formalizes that, even though, in fact, we did take action to appoint those groups, and when we did, it just this makes formalizes it. Um, there is a, an addition on the removal provision, or I should say really a deletion. Um, there, there was a reference in the original bylaws to articles of incorporation that was, I think, just a mistake. Um, and so we've taken that out. Since we are not a corporation, we don't have articles of incorporation. Um, and then we added a provision uh, regarding records, uh, which is just kind of a fairly standard provision for bylaws that you have. You refer to where your records are kept and where they can be found. And that just is, you know, that wasn't in the first one. I think it was just an oversight. So those are the rest of the changes. I didn't hear a lot of discussion on anything except for the live work. Is there any other questions or, or concerns? I have another have? question on the um, conflict of interest section two gifts. So I'm just trying to understand that. So um, if, for instance, there's a $100 a ticket dinner by one of our grantees, the um, trying to reconcile the first sentence and the second sentence there, elected officials can be a guest at that dinner with no cost, but those of us who are not elected cannot do that. Is that correct? At no cost, yes. Okay. And so elected officials, that particular example doesn't fit with the sentence above for elected officials. 
So it just means everything other than social events, fundraisers, or similar activities. Correct. Okay. Meaning they can't get like a product. Right. Okay. An actual item, which would be unusual anyway, but yes. Um, and this wasn't I, changed I guess, really. So is that a, I mean, I, I, that's yeah, a pretty I, low limit, I guess, $10. And I know elected officials, at least in the city, I know we can receive complimentary tickets to an event, but we have to um, report Clear, that. Right, right. right. and you would anyway. I mean, there's nothing in here that would change that requirement. Okay. This is just saying that you're not precluded from doing from actually doing it. Okay. So you have to record it and I report it. I guess I'm thinking it. for the non-elected allocation committee members, whether... If we get invited to a dinner for a particular grantee, not even by an uh, invitation by that... Um, by the organization, but a friend who's buying a table. We're, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to pay. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And I have one overall other question. Um, I think this is great for, you know, taking time out and looking at how can we make the organization more accountable? How can we, um, you know, I take it in part in the spirit of, uh, creating a really balanced um, voice and trying to be as reflective of the community as possible. And so because certain people drop out, there's an opportunity to bring other people on and, you know, aiming for diversity of geographic regions of the city, gender, race. I think those, those things are important. And so I take this somewhat in the spirit of... Um, that it might be good for us not to sit on it forever, so that's one thing. Also that there's kind of a check and balance every two years, that if we're not doing our work, um, we're not reading the dockets, we don't seem, you know, we're, we're not putting a lot of thought into this as intended, or we're making um, decisions that are really questionable, there's an opportunity to turn over. So I, I really um, applaud that. Um, I also think that it would be good, and I'm not sure if it's, it needs to be in the bylaws, but I think it would be good to make sure that we have a feedback loop um, for the staff and for ourselves, some kind of mechanism where, on an annual basis, we're able to give feedback about how things are doing. We haven't really done that formally, and maybe that's something that's that the staff and the, the board could work out. So but we, yeah, I've we had a little feedback that. since yeah. the last meeting. I appreciate that, and I just think that that would be good to do on an annual basis. I agree. I, th I think part of, part of our struggle um, is time. Yeah. And when we're in the funding mode, and because you all are volunteers um, for this job, it requires an enormous amount of your time mm -hmm. just to get through the decisions that you need to make in order to do the funding decisions at the end. And so when I look at the meeting schedule for the last two years, it's been very heavy yeah. on just doing the work. And so um, now that we're you know through a lot of the initial funding decisions, I think mm -hmm. we should take that opportunity, which is partly why we're doing a debrief today, is to try to do more reflection and feedback for each other. And we haven't really done that. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, it might be a good... We'll see how how, um, how packed up the December calendar is. If it's not super packed, we might have some time to do that. Um, so and I think staff, I mean, we do a, because we're employed by the city of Portland, you know, we do with 360s, um, all the staff, and um, get reviewed by Dan as well. So as an employee process, but, but that doesn't give you guys a chance to give feedback. And so that would be, um, we could give you a similar template. Um, for staff feedback as well. So right. I think that would, I I think would be a good idea. And I wasn't thinking at a December open meeting. I was just thinking of an internal process. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's, that's a, well, we can't get you all together unless we have a public meeting. So there's no... But you can't do like questionnaires or something like that? Yeah. Like, written. like you do in a supervisory right. relationship. Yes. No, we, we, we can do, do written like feedback. That. But if we want to discuss it, we have to do it all together. Right. So either way, we can, we can feel you out about what, what you yeah, think well, will be useful. Us, yeah, why don't we work on that? come back with some a proposal okay in that regard I just make a note so I don't forget it okay so would, would there be a motion to pass the bylaws except for that provision in article just a second get the right number article three about the live work I move we approve the bylaws with that exception okay a second right. discussion Okay, all in favor of approving the bylaws, uh, except for the uh, residency provision, say aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous, and we'll do some homework on the residency provision and also some ways to uh, 
uh, better get allocation committee feedback uh, to staff on issues around performance uh, diversity. I think those were the two areas. Mm -hmm. that and potentially feedback to each other, other yeah. I think, is the other piece. So I think it'd be my, there might, we could probably design something that would work, you know, for both. So we'll, we'll come back to you on that and let you know. Sorry, just running a note so I don't forget to do that. Okay. I think I'm not going so, anywhere, uh, so you can move on to the next. Uh, moving on, we're going to now talk about our leverage fund uh, collaboration grants. Again, these grants are funder-initiated partnerships and any of the levies five funding areas. Uh, we'll be hearing an update from the staff on the grant framework and guidelines developed by a collaboration committee created to define this process. And we'll be also be asked to vote on the first potential collaboration grant award. And uh, I thought maybe before uh, Lisa presents, I'd ask Alyssa Kenny Geyer, who is, is on that committee, collaboration grant committee, whether you had any opening remarks that you wish to make, or should we just let Lisa Launch in. Uh, no, I think Lisa can launch in, and, and Meg, who's not here, I guess, not has here. done a really fantastic job on staff on this committee. So okay. I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Lisa? Sure. I'm, I'm sort of channeling Meg today because uh, <laughs> Monday is her uh, day at home with her child. Um, so first, just to remind everybody, because, again, Deborah was not here when we did all of this, so and for her benefit and for anyone else who wasn't maybe paying as much attention um, when we were deciding all of the... Um, sort of rules and regulations about the leverage fund. So again, we put away a pot of $3 million for the leverage fund, which is what we did in the past. So that part's the same. We um, granted 2.5 million of that at your last meeting um, for the challenge grants. Okay, so that was where people had to come in and say, I have this much match dollars and this is what I want to do and you all made the decisions, right? So most of the money has been at least um, theoretically granted. We'll see if people reach all of their match requirements is to see whether the grants are finally made. So we'll have a report for you on that in December because um, that's the deadline for people meeting their first fundraising requirement. Um, most of the grants are going to go forward because most people have met their requirements already and are just fit, uh, getting us the documentation and we're ironing out the contract. So, so that piece is the bulk of the leverage fund is over here and you've already made decisions about that. There's a small piece of the leverage fund, which is a uh, half a million dollars that we set aside to do collaboration grants. And again, it's a little bit of a confusing title because people keep thinking it means we want the providers to collaborate with each other, which was really not the intention. The intention of the collaboration grants was for us to go out and try to collaborate with other funders on projects that might be of mutual interest um, and that would, would bring more resources to uh, those projects, basically, that we both were interested in doing. Um, so that's the headset you have to remember. It's not, it's not about providers. I mean, they could collaborate. That would be fine. But, but that wasn't what the intention of it was. It was to collaborate with other funders. Um, so there was a committee formed um, to sort of help do that work, really, to help go out and work with other funders as well as generate the ideas and figure out how these ideas would be screened, et cetera. So Alyssa is chairing that group. Thank you. Um, that's been a lot of work, and I appreciate her doing that. Um, and she's done a great job. Um, the other members of the committee are Sukri from the Northwest Health Foundation, Mark Holloway from Social Venture Partners, Howard Klink and Colin, Colin McCormick from United Way, and Sue Hildick from the Chalkboard Project. Um, so they're all coming together, they have been coming together pretty much monthly since, since March to, to work on this concept and idea. Um, they came up with sort of a framework um, for how they would try to make those grants. And um, I'll just briefly go over that. Um, uh, and this stuff, just by the way, it wasn't in the past sort of up on the web. We have now put it up on the web so people can understand how these, it's been a little bit of a, um, just an understanding in the community. People trying to understand what are these grants and how are they getting given, et cetera. So, um, so hopefully this will clarify that a little bit. Um, so the, the collaboration grants framework um, includes uh, trying to work with other funders on um, ideas that, you know, that, that, that would have a theory of change that would, would consider system improvements or capacity building efforts that would help improve the quality of what's being offered out there. So something that would sort of um, uh, be an, have an accent on uh, improving uh, the delivery of services that we're funding. Um, project preferences were for supports that can build capacity, lead to system improvement. Um, particularly if they benefited current and grantees. Um, so projects that um, are innovative or they show evidence of learning. Um, so anything that we've learned in previous grants that people might be putting to use in a new grant. Um, looking at the readiness of the project, 
how ready are the folks to go, what is the leverage potential, so we're always looking at that. Um, and then as far as grant size, again, this is a small pool of funds, half a million dollars. Um, we were looking to keep it to four to five grants. We're you know, reaching our carrying capacity on the admin side in terms of the amount of grants we can uh, effectively or see. Um, so we don't want to make um, you know, 25, I don't know, <laughs> you better mental math. <laughs> what does that divide out to? Little teeny grants, you know, lots and lots of little teeny grants, because um, that would be too difficult to administer. Um, so, so that's kind of the general framework. Um, there, you know, in terms of thinking about what sorts of activities would be eligible for funding. So in our current grants, you can only come forward and ask for our money if you're funding, if you're offering services. So only fund services. This would do something broader than that. So some organizational capacity building, system improvement efforts, um, as well as you know direct services uh, to children and families. Um, with this, with the uh, you know with the lens being, this improves the quality of what we're delivering. Um, in most cases, and allows the, the program to do a better job. Um, so all, a lot of the other stuff's the same. That still has to be in our five funding areas. Um, the time periods of the grant have to stay within the current levy period. Um, the match ratio it was not um, specific. You know, they're going to look at each project basically, to, you know, depending on the on the size of it and who the other funders coming to the table are. Um, of course, it must benefit City of Portland residents with our portion of funds um, and. Uh, Involvement of oh, yeah, involvement of applicants and beneficiaries. So depending on the nature of the project, um, the levy uh, you know, the levy working with other funding partners along with input from prospective entities to be funded, they would negotiate scopes of work to be performed under the. I'm not even sure what that means exactly, but I guess that means that you're we're working with the uh, with the maybe Alyssa, you are the one. Maybe you can explain this better than me. Um, uh, I think the concept is you're going to work with whoever the applicant is to help shape what what the what the grant is going to look like, as well as working with the other funding partners. So it's a little bit of a unique relationship, I guess. In the past, you know, we set out an RFP exactly what we want. This is going to be a little bit more working with other people. So we're going to work with who the beneficiary of the grant will be, as well as the other funders of this to see what they want. So a little more collaborative in nature, I guess, is what that's getting at. So we've come to you in the past with a few ideas for. Um, or you know, sort of things that are in motion on collaboration grants. In fact, you did vote to put $100,000 toward a federal application by social venture partners to um, bring quite a bit more money under the social innovation grants to this community. Unfortunately, they did not get that grant, so that did not turn into a leverage opportunity for us. Um, so that one didn't fly, um, but we have been looking at other things. Um, the group is um, working pretty hard on trying to get um, some other funders interested in doing capacity building grants for culturally specific and multicultural organizations since that was an identified need in the community. Um, and uh, they're working on bringing our funders on board for that concept. Um, there is an effort afoot uh, to do coordinated professional development and training for after school and out of, uh, out of school time providers um, that I've been involved in. Um, that again is going forward, but it's not quite at the pre it's not quite at the proposal level yet. Um, they're looking for uh, you know I can give you an update on that probably in December and be ready for an update. Um, but it's definitely. Um, something that's going forward and I think is likely to happen. Um, there was a parenting education hub or clearinghouse in the metro region that has also been, um, it's been worked on by OCF and Meg has been active working with them. It's not clear again exactly where it's going yet, so it's not quite a, at the proposal stage where I can give you the particulars um, on something yet, but it is still in the, an iron in the fire, shall we say, with other funders interested. Um, and then the one that we're currently going to talk about today, which was piloting a trauma recovery services for high needs families um, and developing trauma informed service delivery capacity among social service providers, which is a mouthful, but um, is an idea that came um, to us in part in the, in the regular leverage fund grants. And um, uh, this committee has kind of carried forward, um, done a little bit more work on. Uh, the, this application is by, so this idea, and I'll kind of give you an idea of what this project is, summarize it for you. The collaboration committee, which uh, Alyssa is heading, has already voted to go forward with this. So we're bringing this idea to you now for approval. So with your approval, we would go forward and fund this. Okay, so that's kind of, it's kind of a two-step process for these grants. The collaboration committee has to look at it, decide they want to do it, recommend it to you, and then you all now get to consider it. Um, so I'll go, kind of go through. Um, you've heard about this a little bit because they came uh, forward with this idea um, in the regular challenge grant process. Um, so this uh, application comes from Portland State's University's um, Regional Research Institute. Um, and they would be partnering or, or they'd be getting a grant from the Gates Foundation. So the Gates Foundation has already committed $225,000 to the, this project if the Regional Research Institute can raise their local match. 
So it's a conditional gift on the part of Gates to um, the Regional, Regional Research Institute. That is hard to say. Okay. Um, so Meyer is also going to be considering contributing to this grant. It's going to come before their board, I believe, either November or December meeting. So that's another leverage partner. Um, did you, is there? November. November. Okay, so it will be on their November agenda. Um, we're bringing it forward here for you to consider putting in $100,000 into this project. Um, so what this would do, it, um, it focuses on providing um, group therapy and case management services to chronically homeless mothers um, for three years. Um, the mothers have a history of trauma that has significantly impaired their ability to provide for and parent their children. So there's a specific service model that they want to test here. It's an evidence-based model that's approved by SAMHSA, um, but it hasn't been employed in Portland yet. Um, it's called the Trauma Recovery Empowerment Model, abbreviated TRIM. Um, so the concept is to try to stabilize highly traumatized people and be able to um, allow them to parent successfully so their children don't suffer as a result of the trauma that the parents have been put through, and sometimes the children too. Um, so it would be, the services would be focused in two areas, two low-income housing sites. Um, one is uh, in southeast and one is in northwest. Um, and partner agencies would be involved uh, in the Bridges to Houses project. Well, they're Bridges both, to they're Houses both project. In, they're both in southeast Portland. They're both in southeast. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's impact right. northwest. Yes. Right. I, right. I read that wrong. I was thinking northwest Portland. That's odd. Okay. No, they're both in southeast <laughs> That's Portland. Why. Both okay. in southeast Portland, yes. Esperanza Court and Richmond Place. And two different uh, partner organizations run the programming there. One is Catholic Charities, one Impact Northwest. Um, the partner agencies and sites are, uh, like I said, are involved with Bridges to Housing, which is a former grantee, leverage fund grantee of ours. Um, and they have the particular families that would be targeted with this project are families that have not been successful in the regular Bridges model due to um, high, coming from highly traumatic situations, domestic violence, other situations. Um, and so they're looking for a, a model they can employ to better stabilize these families since the services they were offering previously didn't really do the trick. Um, and it's, again, a small subset of the overall Bridges project. Um, okay, so PSU will provide training uh, regarding trauma-informed service delivery to partner agencies and, um, and also to other agencies who have a role in these families' lives, which will build local capacity um, among service agencies to do trauma-informed services, which is kind of a a little bit of a new topic that uh, I think Deborah might speak a little bit to this and has been involved with it. Um, um, trying to do trauma-informed services to have better success, basically make sure you're dealing with the with the traumas that um, people have experienced um, as well. You're trying to work on things like employment and housing and other stabilizer or parenting or other things that you make sure you have to deal with that underneath. Um, so the collaboration committee screened this project and against its criteria, which are the things I outlined at the beginning, and um, concluded that it met the criteria and voted to go ahead and offer the funding if you all were in agreement. Um, so I guess maybe the, the best thing to do would maybe either take some questions. Also, Alyssa, if you have anything you want to add to that, um, please please do. No, I'd just say that this is one of the grants that originally um, proposals came to us at the uh, last meeting, and it was one of the ones that scored very high, and we agonized because we didn't have enough funding to, sec to secure everything. And at the very end of that, someone got up and talked about how they had just been invited by Gates to send in a proposal. And so a lot's happened since then. They did get that um, grant based on raising local, fun uh, local funds. And um, I think that the proposal that I saw that came to the collaboration committee, the, the only way in which it differed a little from what we saw originally is that there was a very heavy emphasis, not as much on the direct service, but on gathering the lessons learned and really trying to make sure that, that whatever work is done with the families involved through this process is really built into a systemic response to embed these trauma services throughout the housing um, housing services in Portland. And so that was really, in my view, in the spirit of these collaborative grants that allowed us to focus not only on direct services, which all of our other funding does, but really try to get at building a systemic response to these issues. And so I'm very excited yeah. by this. Me too. And I think building local capacity to deal, you know, to sort of teach and spread that knowledge of what they learn in doing this work, which I think is a, a different aspect as well. But not, not all of our grants have that aspect to it, that research and dissemination of research right. aspect. So it's sort of broader, I would say. Sure, thank you. And I don't know whether I need to declare a conflict on this since I have been assisting the folks from PSU um, in working with the county. I mean, not on the board because they don't, they don't really have a board of directors for this project. But I have been, because one of the areas that 
that they're also looking at doing is expanding it beyond the housing arena and looking at really all the social services that Multnomah County provides, uh, be it mental health, um, drugs and addiction, you know, those really, um, hopefully at some point, expanding this program to training throughout countywide to, to impact all the different systems, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why it's so exciting to me. Mm -hmm. So when I first heard about them, um, I've been working on the Bridges program with, with Diane, why, I'm not gonna try to pronounce your last name, <laughs> um, probably a year ago when she started talking to me about this project and I was so intrigued by it. So I have been assisting them, um, kind of getting to know the players at Multnomah County. Um, Diane Gatchmanoff? Yes. Do you, would you wish to, uh, do you wish to say anything about this? Well, you need to come up here. Come on up. Say it yeah. from the microphone and give us your name and affiliation. I'm, I'm Diane Yachmanoff from the Regional Research Institute at Portland State, and um, Lisa did a great job talking about it. And of course, we're very excited about the funding that's coming to the project and being able to start implementing. We're going to start our first groups for families in January. But the systems change piece is the piece that we're the most excited about. And the, it turns out to be the timing is really great. And I'm, some of you probably know the wonderful work that's been done already in this community around um, addressing the impact of trauma to children in our systems, particularly in child welfare and the Children's Relief Nursery with a SAMHSA grant from the national, uh, connected with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has done really terrific work. And the counties come forward to really ask providers, what kind of trauma-specific services do we have for kids? How are we addressing trauma when children come into foster care? And, and all those issues. And so the really great thing is that this extends that effort to look at the trauma that affects their parents and their caregivers and other adults in their lives. And so the timing is really great because the county office of um, mental health and addictions has actually identified trauma services as one of their priority, their concepts in the um, issuing of new contracts on the adult side come July 1st. And so they're very excited about this project and we're going to be partnering with them to do kind of a needs assessment in the community, know where the resources are, who's already doing trauma, great trauma work, because there is good work going on but what are the needs for training and how can we bu really build this project and that because that's the route to sustainability for it and to the ripple effect that will make a long-term impact so we're we're feeling very um excited about it and optimistic so thank you and i have a question any, while you're up sure if um meyer did not come through with the funding how would you go forward is it well, a, is we, there a one-to-one -one requirement from gates no um the Gates Foundation, um, our program officer, Marie, uh, said that um, what they had done is they tried to give us the greatest flexibility possible. They want to make sure that we can get far enough into the project. And we had a conversation during our site visit. If we only got one mm -hmm. grant, would it make sense to go forward? And I had to say, honestly, if we have two, we can do it. But if we only get one, mm -hmm. we got to wait because it's just you don't want to you don't want to have such a weak, diluted project that it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. So we felt that if we got two Mm -hmm. in, we would have enough time. Mm -hmm. And we have some other potential sources of funding that we're beginning to actively seek because we're already getting um, calls. We have two housing sites where we're going to embed the direct service piece. I've already had a call asking, how do we refer to the project? So there, there's, a, there's a lot of, because over this course of this year, we've tried several times to get funding for it. And so it's caused us to reach out and talk to lots of people in the community. So there's lots of folks know about what we're trying to do. And the folks, the champions that really work with children and families are very excited about it because they really see mm -hmm. how this fits with what's gone before. So we're hoping to have more money to expand us some additional sites because Impact Northwest and Catholic Charities were the first to step up and say, we want to do this. We want everyone in our system trained to recognize trauma. That means not just the case managers, but the property managers, the asset managers, the facilities people, because we can do a better job for these families. But other housing partners also said, yeah, we'd love to have a, a project. You know, we, So we're hoping to be able to do more. But it isn't just about PSU doing it forever. We want, to, you know, we want the School of Social Work to turn out more social workers that are trained and trauma assessment and some of these trauma specific services so that the capacity in the community is built and it's not dependent on grants forever. So, so does our pending approval of the $100,000 from our 
leverage fund constitute the local match? That will the release the Gates funds. They just said if we got the... one other, um, that they would they're um, ready ready to go. So yes, your your funding will release the Gates money, and we're pretty we're feeling hopeful about the Meyer Trust as well. So, so it sounds like Gates leveraged us, and we're hoping to leverage Meyer and other funders. Yep. So, yeah, <laughs> that's great. It sounds like a collaboration. Yeah. Grant. <laughs> so, any other questions? Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Well, I think uh, we're going to take the vote. But I thought I'd see if anybody in the audience wished to comment either on the collaboration committee guidelines or on the pending uh, grant application, collaboration grant application for trim. Anybody in the audience wish to comment? Okay, uh, then I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve the collaboration grant. On behalf of the collaboration subcommittee, I'm happy to move that we approve this grant. I move we second it. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it passes. I want to thank, uh, on behalf of all of us up here, I want to thank the collaboration committee, uh, specifically Alyssa Kenny Geyer, who's doing good work chairing that committee. But also, as uh, Lisa mentioned, Sue Free of the Northwest Health Foundation, Mark Holloway of Social Venture Partners of Portland, also uh, Howard Klink and Colin McCormick of United Way, and Sue Hildick from the Chalkboard Project. So thank you for your good work. And uh, I think we're ready to go to our last item, which is a debrief on the leverage fund process. Uh, staff is here to discuss some lessons learned and food for thought on whether we may want to uh, tackle issues differently next time around. Um, I think probably all of us have, have heard there was certainly some concern about the process and, and the committee's, allocation committee's uh, adherence or lack of adherence to staff recommendations, which focused a lot on leverage fund grant potential, the actual potential for an organization to uh, deliver on the leverage fund and also again the uh, issue about high scoring applicants being uh, overlooked in favor of lower scoring applicants I think those are kind of the two issues I heard the most I'm sure others probably maybe heard the same things or different things but this is the time for us to really have a chance to, to talk about that and, and debrief and maybe consider a couple of recommendations for next time. So is it Lisa Hansel or? Lisa? We're both just here to kind of, since we were both at the meeting, we thought we'd both be up here. To, okay. I mean, I'll go ahead and, and introduce some of the topics. And really, the other thing that I was, you know, you know, we, staff had some specific questions we wanted to ask you because they're based on some of the feedback that both we as staff had as well as some of the stuff we heard from the public. Um, but the idea also is if there are things, I mean, you all, well, Ron, you weren't there, but the rest of you went through the process, and this was the first time that we had ever done challenge grants. Now, I know, Deborah, this was your first time ever, so you don't have much to <laughs> compare it to, but, but, um, but it is a little different um, because everybody is in the same pot, right? So normally we're dividing up our money by topic area, right? And so people are com uh, competing against others in the same topic area. This is different. Everybody was thrown together. And also every grant, because leverage fund grants are not renewable, Okay, so they're not coming back again and again necessarily. Um, they're, we're not making decisions based in part on whether we want to continue funding for a program, right? The decisions are based on different issues. So this round of granting was fundamentally different than the, than the granting we've done um, uh, in our regular funding rounds, in which part of what we're considering is, you know, the fact that a program has been funded, how do they perform, do we want to refund them, you know, and if so, at what level? I mean, it, that's a different set of questions often than when you have a completely blank slate and you're trying to figure out, okay, who on this blank slate do I want to fill in? Um, so I do think that these, the, some of the questions we're going to raise are unique to doing this type of funding and are different than what we would be considering in our regular funding rounds. And that's why we wanted to pose them, you know, in, w specifically with regard to this set of funds. Because if we continue doing leverage funding, the same questions are going to keep coming up. Not only that, but if people, there's at least a couple of grants that have not raised their money yet. Okay, so we'll, they have till December 4th, I think? Something like that. That's right about then to raise the first, to meet the first requirement for leverage. And it's possible that some of them won't meet it, in which case you'll be put in the position of having to find another 
person to grant to. Um, so th this may become relevant sooner rather than later, uh, which is part of the other reason we wanted to do it now, um, as well as trying to capture, I mean, it was five months ago, but it's relative, that's relatively fresh <laughs> compared to trying to do it two years from now or something, you know, to remember what you did. Um, so if there are things that came to your mind when you were going through that funding process or looking at the staff uh, work, et cetera, that you would want to do differently, then I would, you know, we want to entertain and have you all discuss those as well, um, as in addition to the things that we noticed. Um, so as um, sort of the first, first thing, big sort of issue, I would say, that we heard a lot of feedback on, um, and that staff had feedback on too, um, is around the, the criteria so we have criteria in the sense that we have a scoring process and there's, you get a, a ranked list and that list has all of the organizations plus their score plus a lot of other variables about them, who they serve, et cetera, culture specific, not geographic, all that. So there's a lot of information you know, on each program. They're all mixed together so you have the list is all different program areas all coming in one lump. Um, and when, so staff made funding recommendations to you all based on the high scoring programs that also we felt met certain leverage fund requirements. So the like, we, we were looking at the likelihood or the persuasiveness of the leverage plan. So the staff was the one that scored the leverage plan and we kind of took that through a level of analysis um, to decide that. Um, when you all came together, um, I would say both the, so we got feedback from the community as well as um, feedback from just on the staff that that was less important to you, that the persuasiveness or the credibility of the leverage plan was not maybe the first thing in your mind when you came to make decisions about who should be funded. Um, and so um, we had, you know, questions whether did it make, did it make, and in addition, there was need was put on the table as a potential criteria. So the need of the population that was gonna be served by the program um, was put on the table as a criteria. Um, and that's, you know, so in our RFP, in, in the RFIs that were used, need was not really, we didn't ask them to address need or community need or explain how their program was gonna deal with a pressing need. And we didn't, they're not, they were not judged in comparison to each other based on the level of need, um, you know, of the, of the population they were serving. Um, so th I would say that there was feedback from the community that they, people were unclear about the um, criteria that were being used to decide uh, between and among these programs, um, besides, of course, the scores. You've got the scores up there, but, you know, what else is important? And, you know, is there some argument for trying to develop some kind of shared criteria amongst you all for how these particular grants are gonna be judged, because given that this is a different situation, that this is always, you're always starting with a blank slate with these. You're not starting with things that were funded in the past necessarily, right? Um, so uh, it's a different ball game than it is when we look at our other grants. Um, do we need to think a little harder about what kind of criteria we wanna, and, and on the front end, so that we can tell people ahead of time what that looks like? Because I think, um, Staff, and sort of the subsidiary issues to that is I think around the leverage issues, people put a lot of time into writing these leverage applications. We asked for a lot of detail, and we spent an enormous amount of time as a staff doing the analysis on that that took a ton of time. And you know we're happy to do the work, and we're happy to ask people to do the work if it's meaningful to you all. If it's not really what you care about first, then I would suggest that we take down the requirements, make them less intense in terms of what we're asking for to prove leverage and take down the level of analysis that we're doing as a staff on whether that leverage is plausible or not, um, because I don't I don't like to ask for information that's not really you know not really used or it's not really of prime consideration. So so we would want to modify our process if that's really not the top consideration for you all. Um, you know, second of all, I think there's issues around the issue around need. If you really want to look at need. A, I think, the, again, the RFP might need to be modified, you know, to include that so people understand they're going to be judged on that. Two, if there's a danger in using that criteria in this funding round when you've got all five categories of funding lumped together because child abuse prevention intervention and, fo and services for foster care are aimed at higher need populations by definition than early childhood, after school mentoring. Okay, those are more broad-based and prevention-oriented categories of funding. You know, they, they could be high. They could be directed intensively or they could not be. But you're, you're giving, if you're looking at need of the population, you're giving kind of an automatic advantage to programming that is addressing very high needs populations. So that's a consideration there that if you're going to use that funnel, I mean, and as it is, five out of nine grants that we made were for child abuse 
programs. So, I mean, I think that came through in a certain sense. So I, I think that I, this, this is all kind of by way of saying to you all, um, it might be worth going through a bit of a process to figure out when you're making these grants, what is most important and what other lenses in terms of priority do you want to run these um, proposals through? Um, before you make your decisions? And could we give people that information on the front end? Um, because I think that would help them, and I think it would help people feel less surprised by the results um, in the end. So that's kind of my speechifying on the topic. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts. And if you, in, I think it would be helpful to hear from people what are their prior, in, in this type of granting, keeping in mind we're talking about leverage fund challenge grants here. What is important to you in making these grants? That would help us as a staff, and I think help the community understand. Better. Do you want to go to the second issue too about whether we should make two hundred fifty thousand the minimum or max, or do you want to discuss this first and then? Um, I think this would make sense to discuss this first. I'd like to hear something about that. And we can talk about size as well. Um, I mean, I'm not saying we have to make a decision today. I'd just be curious to hear what people think, and then I think as an ongoing process, we might want to think about how do we make that more formalized. Um, but I don't know what people feel about it yet, so I have to ask. Well, I can start off, as you can imagine. <laughs> I have, you know, we've talked about it before, so I have mm -hmm. some thought on this. Um, I think you're right. It was the first time around. We're feeling our way through it. It's the appropriate time to ask that question, so I'm glad you created the time to put this on the table. Um, the, uh, boy, I have so many thoughts. I'm trying to figure out what order. Uh, just taking the leverage piece first and the analysis that you did and the allocation of points for those um, leverage funds, um, I, I, get, I guess I just started with a very different assumption than staff had, um, and Deborah and I both expressed this at the beginning, well, at that meeting, that public sector funds were necessarily going to be more at risk than private. Um, I'm on a couple of private foundations, and so I said this at that meeting. I think that those are at risk as well. Assets have gone way down. One of the issues that was raised at that meeting is that public sector funding tends to get allocated year by year, and so you don't know what's going to happen in the second and third year. That's often the case with private foundations, unfortunately, as well. So I guess that just on the very start of how you look at this leverage fund, I was really looking at it as an opportunity for this committee to say, here are some really needed services in the community. Here's an opportunity for us to um, provide a challenge grant to the other funders, whether they're private or public, to really leverage. To me, that was part of the point of the whole thing, and that there is no guarantee as you start out, but that because we feel that these are meeting pressing needs in the community, and these rise to the top, and I'll get to the question of what is, what is the top and how do we get there, which is a really sticky question. But because we've identified these as needs that we really hope get funded, we're going to put out a challenge grant. And there is no guarantee. But, but um, what I would say in terms of the process is that um, I think that you have tried really hard to let people know at the front end to the, to the um, extent that you could predict this, what they could expect, and how we would be making decisions. And that's very hard, because we hadn't been through this before. And so we had spent a lot of time at a previous meeting talking about uh, what's the bare minimum in terms of cash versus in kind. And we came up with a specific number. I forget what it was. 50% had to be at least cash or something like that. And we also talked about, because the majority of the committee felt there was a preference toward cash, I actually didn't feel that. I thought, you know, in a, in a, in a cash-strapped economy, we should be trying to really tap into volunteers. But the majority felt that there would be a preference, and we stated that. And that was um, stated in, in your bidders conference, and I believe in your RFI. The, um, we did not say in the RFI or the bidders conference, I wasn't at it, but I read the notes for it. We did not say um, there's going to be a, pr uh, a preference toward private funding because we see that as more stable. That was not something we let them know in advance. And so then to come around and dock them for, in terms of points, for having more of a reliance on public sector funding, I felt was both um, not something we had forewarned them, in, unless I wasn't there, you said something about that, but also not an assumption that I adhered to. 
So that's one point I would like to say in terms of whether it's a smart idea to put points on something as subjective as predictability of, of what's going to raise funds. The second thing I would say is um, putting that much, putting numbers takes a lot of your time is very subjective. And I think that uh, what I would prefer to see is like you have a column for financial analysis, if there's a certain number of financial indicators that raise questions about an organization's ability to financially be accountable and sustain itself, I, would, I do think that it's important to ask the information of organizations because what I would look at is have they really thoughtfully presented a plan of how they hope to leverage these funds? And if there are some major questions, like they think they're going to try to raise a million dollars and they don't have a track record, I, I would want to be alerted to that, but I don't think it lends itself well to a kind of a point system. So I'm truly sorry that, that um, the staff went through a huge process like that, and, and then I, for one, didn't um, see eye to eye on those assumptions. Which brings me to another point, which is when we were trying to come up with a new process for how are we going to go forward, uh, there... I understand that there was so much happening at once in trying to allocate a lot of these funds in, in the first round of direct services and then the leverage and then we've got collaborative right after that. So some way that perhaps as you're trying to roll out a new process, there's a check-in. I don't know if it needs to be in a public setting or whether you come to us and say, Here, here's how we plan on analyzing and scoring and presenting to you our thoughts on leverage fund maybe we could have had that discussion earlier and save that. We're having it now, so that's good. And I'm only presenting my opinion. Other people may feel very differently. But I'm sorry that we didn't have that and didn't foresee that. And I'm sorry that the staff went through a lot of hard work um, for that. Um, I think that's the main thing I want to say about the, the scoring for the leverage points. But addressing need, because that also came up in this conversation. Um, I was one of the ones that talked about trying to base it, you know, base some of our decisions on need. Um, I went back and looked at the RFP, and it doesn't actually say, you know, what, you know, address the need, as a lot of proposals often do. If that's something that you feel that we should add, perhaps we should. I did feel that it was inherent in a lot of your questions. Who do you plan to address? You know, how do you, how are you going to, address this population, what are the expected outcomes? I feel like it's inherent in everything we do. Certainly in the public gathering process that we had before we went through the whole round of grant making, even before the ballot was passed a second time, um, there, the whole question was around the community, what are the, big, what are the big needs? And my interpretation of that, which I've tried to articulate every time and just probably not done a good job of it, is that the needs in the community, we need to focus on the really low income. We've had this discussion before. We looked at the Sun School programs. They might score incredibly high. Sun School over at um, Selwood, who they can receive very, very high scores on program delivery. There hasn't been a question about that. But we made through a very agonizing decision on this committee about deciding to withdraw funding, close off funding for certain programs that we felt didn't address the highest areas of need and transfer that to some of the, the schools that were um, Tier 1 and Tier 2, as opposed to Tier 3 and Tier 4. Mm -hmm. So we've had this discussion multiple times. We've also identified need as the, the disproportionality of high school dropouts, kids in foster care, et cetera, by race. And we've made a conscious decision to, to um, try to put as many funds as possible into that, and that one of the strategies toward that, not the only strategy, is to really support culturally specific organizations. Another is the concentration of poverty and lack of services east of 82nd. That was identified as a high need. So as I made my decisions, I, I, re, I woke up at 5 this morning to look at that whole meeting again so I could have it fresh in my mind. And it came down to, th you know, we had basically 775,000 left to divide among three groups with a minimum of 250,000. And they were really hard decisions. And, you know, in terms of the intensity of services, we were trying to balance that out. In fact, one of the decisions came down to there was Peninsula Children's Center that was going to do enhancement services for 250 kids at a time where ERDC funds looked like it was drying up versus a more intensive at Friends of the Children. You know, I, I argued for 
spreading it around more because we did have some others that we had funded that wore more intensive services, Rosemary Anderson and, and um, others. The, uh, another one that it came down to was Open Meadow and SEI. Um, SEI, I thought we left it up to SEI whether it was going to be the mentoring program or the child abuse, whichever one needed more. The, the mentoring program actually um, scored higher, and I think you were leaning toward that, and I was leaning toward the child abuse one, but what I said in that meeting was, I think that it should be where they can get the leverage fund and where they feel <clears throat> the greater need is, but both of those programs scored high, and it was a culturally specific organization. One of the things that we found in your analysis after we had done all the funding in that first round of all the different five issue areas for the next three years is that although we tried really hard to um, prioritize culturally specific organizations, in fact, we didn't increase that much. So that was very much in my mind as I made some of these really hard decisions. I didn't mean they're meeting a greater need than this. At that point, the organizations that we were considering at that point when there were, I think, seven left and we had to pick three, they were all really good organizations. All these organizations scored 80s and 90s on their program score. We, we did lament the fact at the time that we weren't able to spread it over all five issue areas. The, the foster care is the one area that didn't get any. That came in terms of scoring 21st on the list and we could only do six to eight. So it was hard to, to justify you know, squeezing that in. But there were a lot of really good programs. So the last thing I will say is that I've always had an issue with just really counting on scores. One of the feedback that I got from one of the groups that wasn't funded was they felt they were double hit because they, um, we already attribute three points to outer southeast or to culturally specific organizations. And then um, even with that score, they had a teeny bit higher score than one of the other groups that got funded. And they felt like it's a double whammy. You know, you're, you're giving them extra points, and then you're still saying, regardless of them having extra points, we need to fund more organizations that are culturally specific. My recommendation is that we take away the three points for outer southeast and culturally specific, even though it was a way to symbolize our priority and get back to the point where we say, these are the scores of how this proposal meets the RFP, what the program delivery is. I mean, those, those are, you know, I, I think those numbers are important because they give us a baseline. And then we have to look at um, how do you balance that out across the, the variety of needs in the city. That's why you have an allocation committee. That's what you look at it from a business perspective. That's why we have Portland Business Alliance. You look at it from a county perspective, from a city perspective, from a pi private philanthropy perspective, and you put all that together and you look at it across ethnicities, geographic areas, um, age range, et cetera, how do you balance it out? And it's really hard. There were a number of programs that could have been chosen. But that's the accountability piece, that the, that the scorers who are looking at three or two, two or three or four different proposals in groups of three or four and aren't able to look at the whole thing, they can't do that. And in fact, we don't know who those scores are. So I think that the system of accountability that we have built into this process is actually a good one. I think that some of the concerns out there are also valid and, and you know, I think that we need to de-emphasize the scores. Maybe we say, maybe we do a cutoff and say those that are above it are really, you know, they're good programs. Now how do we balance this out? Then you hold us accountable. And you're adding accountability by saying, and you have to be voted back in every two years. You know, give your reasoning and get, and then, and then, you know. So anyway, that's where I am on that. It's a really hard, it's a hard question. Well, I did want to just to underscore what you just mentioned, one of the ideas was that we, in future rounds, have some score cut off above which uh, will be the group we make decisions. We may not necessarily we may not make decisions necessarily on the top five scores, but we may choose the top five out of a ten that reach a certain uh, score cutoff. That's certainly one of the suggestions that I heard. Um, I also, um, I do think that um, this process was much more sophisticated than our first leverage fund uh, round and our first go round. And um, I do think there was, uh, I think Alyssa makes a good point that maybe private sector foundation monies are no more secure or reliable to count on 
than public sector funds. I know that any agency or any organization that applied with sort of public sector funds was, you know, rightly sort of questioned whether the money would be there, whether it's school district or whether it was a county or state, just given the enormous financial situation that uh, those organizations are in right now. Um, so I, I, I guess I want to just raise the point of maybe there is, and I think staff did a lot of work analyzing, and to me, it's sort of the leverage, the grant, or where they're getting their matching funds, and that at least for 50% of it be cash is still important to me. Uh, I think, as I said, when we first made the decision about using in-kind versus cash, I was concerned about, you know, going out, being able to go out to voters and say, we took $5 million and we turned it into $10 million. And uh, we're, we've gone a different route on that, but I'm, I'm comfortable with that route, and that was the will of this committee. But I'm also just kind of hearkening back to our first leverage fund go-round. Um, seemed a lot simpler. We just kind of, you know, we set aside $5 million. I believe it was five million, and three. it was three million. I'm, I'm sorry. Why am I saying five? It's three million, and we sort of, you know, opened the window for organizations to then find a private or public funder, I believe, and, and all private. It was all private, and then simply, you know, approach us about matching whatever they had in mind. Well, it was run, I mean, the, again, the reason that we try, essentially what we tried to do the first round of leverage grants was what the collaboration grants are currently trying to do. That's what we attempted to do. We attempted to work it from the funder basis. So we hired somebody to go out and try to kind of help those relationships with other funders and try to collaborate with them. And it didn't really work out all that well. Um, we didn't get a lot of interest, and um, it was mostly provider-driven. So providers would contact um, us and say, I've got a, Ga a Gates grant in, they're really, it's looking positive. Um, could you call my program officer? And, you know, I think this would be a great fit for the levy too. And, you know, we did a lot of great projects, don't get me wrong, and there was great private money brought to bear. It's not a bad thing, but it was, people felt like there wasn't um, open access to the money because it was, and there was no process behind it to really figure out how it was going to get driven. So this was an attempt to sort of open it up and allow people to come in and show us what their leverage was and, and get the ch fair chance to all kind of compete against each other. So that was sort of why we went to this uh, method was to try to formalize it a bit and make it less mysterious to people on the outside about how they might get a challenge grant. Um, so I, I think... You know, it was simpler to do it the other way, I agree. Um, it was definitely far more work to do it, <laughs> do it this way. But we felt like it was a more open and fair chance for people to all come in and try to get a shot at the money. Um, I think it is your right to point out that it was all private money that was leveraged last time. It was not about public money. And if you remember, when Ted Wheeler was on the committee, there were significant um, discussions about public money. And we said, you know, it was not gonna, we were not going to allow general fund money to be matched because it's too malleable. You can't figure out where it's coming from. So the public money was limited to grants. So, you know, there, there are situations in which public entities run competitive processes to give, you know, some kind of grant to organizations such as Portland Public gave grants to certain culture-specific organizations to offer certain sets of services. Some people came in and wanted to use those grants as leverage. And we said, okay, yes, you can do that. Um, but those decisions are made year to I mean, I think there, I, there's one thing I'll add into the discussion around sort of the public versus the private leverage that, um, that staff thought about that um, I think still bears on some level. Yes, it's true that all funding is insecure always. I mean, you know, that's just the life. Um, I, I would say that when we're looking at the leverage plausibility um, situation, on the public side, we're looking at politics and budgets and those kinds of things to try to determine what's plausible or likely or possible. On the private side, we're looking more toward, um, yes, people can yank funds, but when private foundations give grants, typically they follow through on the grant. So when someone comes in and says, I have the grant, it's two years, okay, that means more to me than the public funder saying, well, you got the money this year, we'll see for next. Okay, so those are not equally weighted in the staff's minds. We did not, those are not the same thing. Okay, so yes, private funds can be insecure, but when someone has the grant in hand, it's no longer insecure, okay, and the same level that it is to say, well, the county gave me money this year, hopefully the county will have money for me next year, or the school board when we're looking at the situation in our community. So staff didn't weight those equally. Um, the other piece of it is that um, when you're looking at organizations and when we were doing our analysis around plausibility, we were looking at 
How good are they at fundraising? Of course, yes, of course, there's always tremendous competition. What are their records like? You know, do they typically, you know, and, and people gave very detailed analysis, some of them, and the best scored leverage plans were the ones that did, that said, you know, hey, we go out, we typically get this percent of money. Here's our plan. Here's who we're applying to. We expect to get, we're applying for this much. We expect to get this much. So when people gave that kind of detailed analysis, yes, of course, the money's insecure. We're not taking it as secure. But it's a, they've gone through a thought process and they're showing us their past performance and their plan for the future, that still, to me, rises above the school, the school district gave me money this year and hopefully they'll have money for me next year. So that was the waiting. It wasn't that there was an automatic preference for public-private grants, but the public grants that we looked at were, a, by definition, a year public grant because it has to be renewed the next year, whereas a private grant's Sometimes we're already committed for the two years. They write a contract and they give you the money. Or we're basing it on a plan that is persuasive for some other reason. Okay. But, you know, so I'm not trying to say there's no insecurity on the private side. Of course there is. But it's a different situation in today's world. So that, that's the one, that, that was where we came from, I would say, in, in making our judgment. So I'm hearing what you're saying. I mean, I hear from Alyssa that you're not, you don't, you don't want, you don't, this kind of detail is not really that relevant to you in terms of how you would judge leverage and you would not score those plans separately. It would just be part of the application. I hear from Dan that those are important on some level, but maybe you don't need the same kind of detail that you were given in the past. It would be nice to hear from other folks about what they think about that. Yeah, I actually <clears throat> excuse me, um, would agree that to me it is important, and I like how Alyssa put it because I do think that she said it was important in the sense that show it in indicators and not scoring. And so that way maybe you know, you're not requesting from the applicants to provide so much detail and staff's not been going through analyzing it as much, but then at least what I want to see is, at least, you know, they have their plan, what is their plan to, to you know, uh, seek the funding, and that there at least is a plan in place that they're moving forward. It's not that they're just, you know, providing an application and then waiting to hear if they get the funds and then moving forward, but just at least something demonstrating that they are moving forward, but maybe not to the level of detail that you have already um, done this past round. So it's kind of a happy medium because to me it is important. I, you know, if, if they don't have leverage funding, then this is not going to be successful. And so I would hate for them to still even apply and, and wait till the last minute to then find um, some leverage funds. Instead, I would at least have some way to demonstrate that they are moving forward. <clears throat> so wrapping it into the application. Important, but just indicators and not scoring. Okay, so would you imagine that they would answer the, but all questions are scored, so that we have to score it. Somebody's got to score the, the well, question, right? Well, I would say not right? scoring. I think the question of whether it's well thought out, whether they have a plan, maybe even put plan A, plan B, if this doesn't come through, is good. I think what I'm questioning is, um, number one, the underlying assumption that it, it, it we have to be as secure as possible because I think part of the whole point is when a county or a school district is deciding where to put funds, it might tilt the balance toward funding a program that we've identified as a priority area. That's part of the whole point of the leverage fund. Um, so I think it's in that spirit that I, that I offer that. But the other is just in judging plausibility. I, th I think I personally have a little bit of a different perspective on how how many private foundations will do advanced funding. I think Gates is great in that uh, not many others um, go out far in advance. So um, I, I think I just weigh the plausibility. So if you had put your analysis without an actual number, I know there was someone from, um, someone, Susan Fleming from one of the groups who said, I don't know why we scored so low. We have 100% of this and this and this. And um, there, were, there were other groups here that um, I thought had really good solid plans and got lower scores. So I think part of it is it just, it puts so much emphasis on a number which is so subjective and I think we just, you know, we need to say, well, I'm a little concerned about that. This would be a great thing. Let's put it out there because we're really hoping it'll leverage funds but we're concerned they may not make it or whatever. That's, that's the basis for the discussion. So going toward, it sounds like going toward more general, give us a plan. Well, this is just um, me. I mean, I'm sorry. No, I'm, 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 I'm listening. I, want to, I mean, I want well, to ask other yeah. people too, but let me just throw something out there. Okay, I want to get everybody's input. But uh, the general Before direction. You, before you throw something out, but it seems to me that in the private sector foundation world, just from my knowledge, being on the outside of all that, is you know, there's usually sort of a prospectus that somebody. Uh, 
files with the foundation and then they sort of get invited to submit a more detailed proposal? Depends on the foundation. They all work differently. I'm so. just throwing that out as maybe an approach we wish to use as well. That we, you know, get maybe a one pager from people that organizations with a brief outline of what they're hoping to do, where their leverage fund is coming from, and then some predetermination is made, and we can sort of invite uh, a, a smaller list than from those prospectuses. I just wanted to throw that out before you. Yeah, I mean, we've entertained the idea of two-step processes before, and I'm, I don't, I'm not, I think they're better processes overall, but they just take longer. So you're always balancing how much time you want to take to get the money out versus how much time you want to take making the decision. So, um, so I think that wouldn't be undoable. I think that you, the process would need to be designed in advance of execution because that's always our conundrum. We have to design the process and then quickly do it because we don't really want to, especially in this economy, leave money sitting around. I mean, we want it to be out there working for kids. So, so I think if we wanted to go to that kind of process, we should design it on the front end so that the next time it could be carried out, we wouldn't be designing it. It would just be taken off the shelf and do it. Um, then you could do it quickly, and it wouldn't take that kind of turnaround. You could, or put it this way, you wouldn't have to spend the time, the six months it takes to make the decisions first and then execute the process. So I'd be willing to entertain that if other folks were interested, but I think that then that should be our, we should figure out what that process looks like um, you know, in the next year so that when, it, or well, whatever. I mean, we may be forced to make more leverage fund decisions <laughs> prior to that anyway. So I don't know that we change it for that just because it might take us some time before we'd have to make those decisions. But um, but for the overall long term, which never ends up being that far away, um, it might make sense to think about it on the front end. I'd be curious, well, let me throw, what I'm hearing here is that a more general question um, I think there would still be some points assigned to the question because there's always a points assigned to every question we ask, I guess. So it would be still score in some way, but would, maybe staff wouldn't score it. It would just be part of what the reviewers score. And it wouldn't be analyzed in terms of numbers, really. We wouldn't do all that heavy-duty numerical analysis. We would just say, tell us your plan, and you got, and we'll give it, a, we'll give it the test of about, is this seem plausible or not? And kind of change the criteria and make it more general, because it's much more specific now. Do you have half raised? Can you demonstrate what's the likelihood of getting half by in six months? I mean, we, we ran it through very specific screens in making our recommendations and scoring on this. So it sounds like cut that part out and take it back to a more of a finger in the wind test. I, <clears throat> I guess I have to, uh, a question kind of back to you is, do you, are you interested in hearing from us what will make the public feel more comfortable when the, with the decisions that we ultimately make? Is that kind of what the goal of this is or is it because I, I mean, I think there's some issues here that we, you know, some deeper issues, which are really the subjective versus objective piece of it. I mean, I, when you put numbers on a piece of paper, it makes it look like it's really objective, but it's not really. It's still a human being looking at it. I mean, as, as Alyssa and, and Adrian pointed out, it's, it's people that, we, that I, I don't know who they are, random people in the community, filtering it through their own process. I don't think that's any more objective than us here at this table who have presumably a greater, broader perspective on what's going out in the community. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's somewhat daunting and intimidating this conversation even because it's making me feel a little bit like the, the decisions that we make are very subjective, whereas the people that scored in the community were doing, you know, with the numbers was a different kind of process. And I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think that I looked at the leverage piece, I went through the application, maybe part of it, in, in addition, was that I had a week to go through these, and it was really, I didn't feel like that was enough time for me to go through all the applications, um, especially because, personally, you know, we, we were having our budget, very difficult budget at Multnomah County, so it was hard for me to go through, but I, I think that um, I tried to the best of my ability to look very objectively through these. I do think at some point, though, there is going to be just by the nature of us being human, that there's going to be some, and you know, we're going to look at what's occurring in the community at the time. I mean, we were talking about the ERDC funds, um, and and that's why I would argue for for flexibility. I mean, I think it's hard for us to sit here today and put together another process that we're going to use. We may use it sooner, but we may it may be several years until we do this process again, and who knows what what the what it's going to look like at that time. I mean. 
whether. Well, I mean, I think you have old, you always have flexibility. I'm not trying to say one's objective or one's subjective. I mean, I don't, if you're taking that from my comments, that's not what I intended at all. I don't think anybody would pretend that objectivity exists in any, <laughs> maybe in the scientific world and even quantum mechanics would dispute that. So I, I don't, you know, I don't know that you could, I'm not trying to say one over the other. I'm just trying to say what I, what I think would help people feel better about it afterwards on some level and also I think would help you all in making your own decisions. So yes, you have a set of numbers and you have a set of facts that you can look at to help make decisions. Um, if there are other things that are of import, for, I mean, I think need is something different, I would say. I think that the ge for in the RFI, it says we're going to look at geographic balance. We're going to look at culturally specific. We're going to look at some of these other factors. Need isn't really in there because all of our grants have been... A, pretty much addressed to low-income people. So, I mean, in terms of a, an over... And, and when we did ask for need information in the past, it didn't help anybody because everybody's serving folks who have significant needs, right? So it just... It didn't... It, but I think inherently, if you're looking at an after-school program that's, um, you know, even serving a high-poverty school versus looking at a program that's serving children who are actually abused, I mean, and, and when people are weighing these kinds of things, people tend to go toward the high... and say the need is greater, um, for the child who's been abused or traumatized than it is for the after-school program um, aimed at, you know, high poverty, but kids who are not, maybe haven't gone through all this other stuff. So, I, I, and I think that came out in the, in the decisions, that the, the child's programs or the more of them were able to secure funding. So I, th that was my, my concern in wanting to be more clear at the outset so yes people understand and also to understand what is i mean what does need mean you know how you're going to look at need or how you're going to um process that it is no it's not objective but if you all have thoughts about what that looks like and what would be most important to you i think it wouldn't be a bad idea to get that on the table ahead of time if you want to use it i'm not against using the criteria i just think it would be better to put it at the front end so that people know where you all come from really, more than anything else. Does that make sense? Yes, but I mean, I think in the way that we have it set up where everybody is competing against everybody, I don't know how you're going to remove that. I mean, I think it, people just have to go into this process knowing that I'm going to be competing against a program that's X, Y, Z, you know, that's focusing on, you know, the most abused children in the entire city of Portland, and on my children, my program is an after-school People just are going to know. I mean, know that and know that at that moment in time, maybe the other program is more needed, or maybe if we funded five programs based at the real high need children, then we want to look at something that's more of an after school. Which is, I think, actually, despite the fact that you, that so many of the programs that were funded were um, child abuse, I felt like we tried to get kind of a cross section in there, and we tried to really spread out the funding from for to different groups and different Jew I mean I, I felt like it was in the end I, I a product that I was proud of. I, I felt that too and, and child abuse also goes throughout the whole ranges. I mean it's um, like the Janus program both had the partnership with the Native American Youth Association which was a culturally specific organization. That's one of the reasons it it ranked high to me when we were down to those trying to choose three. Mm -hmm. And it dealt with teens as well as their children. So it really spanned that age spectrum. So I think that I was trying to, you know, I was trying to compare groups that it, it, it was just hard. I mean, I didn't well, see. It's never easy. Right. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of it as mm -hmm. the abused child. I was thinking of it in prevention, the geographic range. And I would say the same thing. There were ones that I really lost sleep on that we weren't able to fund. Not because I didn't think that the need was very compelling. It's just we didn't have enough money. But when you're down to those last two or three, you're having to make trade-offs like that. And all you can do is articulate to the best ability and know that it's completely subjective at that point and take responsibility and accountability for it and be willing to accept the angry phone calls afterwards. But I, I don't know how else you can go about it. I, I agree. I think that at some level it's, I mean, it's like any funding decision made anywhere. At some level, people... You can set up a process to the best of your ability, but at some level, people are not going to be funded and they're going to be unhappy about it. I don't know that my experience working with um, private granting agencies has been any different. I mean, I've gone along, had a, a, a proposal and it's gone all the way along where um, the manager that we were working with said, this is so great, oh my God, this is the best, and helped us, help us, and in the end, the board said, eh, 
And they didn't give me, you know, a list of here's the five reasons why. It was just there were other good, good ish programs out there, and you, you're left in the dark. I mean, I think this, pro this process is more open and transparent than any other process that I have seen. So I don't, I think one of the, I guess my issue with the way that we're discussing is it's coming from a somehow mistakes were made. And I know people were unhappy, but no, no, people, no, so, uh, okay, because I, I feel like it's <laughs> coming mistakes. at, it's coming at that we heard complaints from, from citizens that didn't get funded and therefore we need to look at how we can change this process to make it more transparent, which I guess that's why I asked what, why we're going through this, because I think in the, this is the most transparent process I've seen. To just let me well, I mean, we're, we're coming from the perspective of always trying to do better. I mean, that's, you know, we're always trying to do better, to tweak change. So, I mean, I, that, that, I would say that's been, I mean, you haven't been here as long, but that's been right. probably fairly typical for those of you who have been here longer, that we're, every time we complete something, looking back to say, well, what went well and what didn't go well. So it's not, it's not that I feel like, I don't think any bad problems are fun. I don't think you made mistakes, and I certainly wasn't coming at it with that perspective. I'm trying to relay feedback that's given to me that's beyond just I'm unhappy because I wasn't funded. Okay, we get that all the time. Um, that's not the purpose of this. The purpose was really to say, if we are employing other criteria that are something that we're not really being clear about stating, do we want to, and there's things that are important to us, Okay, do we want to say what they are? Do we want to think about what that what they are so that when we craft the next RFP or RFI that we include those? Okay, so it, that's all I was trying to get at is if there are things that we're not capturing that are important to you, we should include them, you know, and put them out front. So, you know, if it if what I'm hearing is that the answer is no, okay? We've said everything that's important to us and it's going to be a decision at the end and there's not much we can do about that. So, that's okay. I'm not saying we have to do it. I'm just saying I wanted to ask a question. Um, I think that um, the issue around, I think I all, we also, so one of the ways we were, at, we were trying to get is there criteria that you want to add, essentially, that we haven't really articulated before. I think I'm hearing no on that. The other question I was trying to ask was, and I think I've gotten some level of answer, and I would be curious to hear your two feedback about this, is we don't need so much detail and focus on numbers in the leverage plan, and that we can do that in a more general way, and we don't need to be running the applicants through such a ringer and us through such a ringer. So that's a concrete question that we wanted to address about how much and what we're asking for, so it's to not put people to useless work. So that's, that's the, was sort of the twofold point of that question. So and I would I would agree with that. I mean, any time you can reduce the amount of work the applicant and and staff has to go through, if it's not, I mean, I think that's well. I'm of, asking you: is it material? Yeah. Is is so? Was the information you got way more information than you wanted about leverage plans? Yeah, I think so. I think it, I think it was even though it's more, important to me. It's it was more information than I could synthesize in a week. I mean, so I would say yes. Okay. I mean, I know you weren't a part. I don't know if you have any thoughts. I was just going to say, I, I think uh, we've all wanted to make sure life is more simple for the staff because we don't want to have more staff and we want to streamline things. So, you know, we, we want to make it as simple as possible, and it does sound like there was too much information. Um, I did want to address Elisa just for a second, and that is since Elisa came on the board, and I, I really appreciate this fact, every time she's always clarified that scoring is just one part of the criteria. And... Uh, I think we continue to need to say that to the grantees, and that is we wouldn't need the committee and we wouldn't need the council or the commission if we just went by scores. Mm -hmm. So those are things that we look at, and I, I think they're very important, but each of us do bring a unique uh, perspective, mm -hmm. and I appreciate you, you clarifying that too, that the scores matter a lot, but it's not going to be the only thing, and we're still going to look at that other things and, and, and listen to each other, and I think we've worked well at that. So as we go forward, I, I think I'm speaking for all of us, mm -hmm. as you're all nodding, is that scoring is going to be one of the criteria, and we'll, mm -hmm. just because they got the top score doesn't mean that we'll necessarily red stamp it or pick them that they'll get their grant. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that you've made that clear all the time, and it makes me feel more comfortable, <laughs> too, when you say that. I do think in, in that vein, I would propose that next time around, I don't know that we need to make this decision now, that we remove the three points. I think it just it adds to the mentality of every little point difference is going to make the difference. I think we just need to lay out, as you suggested, lay out our priorities of things that might tip a balance. And if you choose to score the leverage fund at all, which actually 
I'm not in favor of. I'm more in favor of doing a financial column. This leverage plan doesn't look solid. It hasn't been thought through. Something like that. Um, so you're saying it shouldn't be scored at all by anybody? I don't think that the leverage plan needs to be scored. I think it should be viewed in the same way that the financial material is viewed. But that is scored. When you do a finance, no, the, the way John does. The, the, the financial, there's some does. certain indicators there's that come up on the 990. There's certain right. Well, but wait a second. No, that, but that's a specific. That's that, those are not comparable because the audit, it, it, what he's doing is an audit tool. So it's a specific set of financial indicators on the overall health of the organization based on the audit. There's no similar screening tool that I can apply to a financial plan. So I, I wouldn't want to. Then it would be a comment. Do you know what I'm about, saying? Um, this looks like a great service delivery. They don't have any idea of who they're going to go to for their match. It's not a thought out. I still think they need to go through the work of suggesting who they're going to go to and if you're in hand. That, that's kind of narrative, I guess. Um, I, I, if you're going to put a score on it at all, I would downweight it. I would not weight it as heavily as you did. Maybe that section is five points or something. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of, we're getting a little too operational, but I want to de-emphasize any kind of scoring if we use it at all for that. I think what's more important to me is not trying to guess whether within the next nine months the school district is going to decide this way or that or the or a, or a private foundation or um, the county, I do think that it's very important that they have a thought-out plan. They need a business strategy on how they're going to go about doing this. And, and that's partly what I was looking for when I actually read their leverage plans. So it sounds like the um, narrative or our na the analysis that we did, that information was helpful, but the score was not exactly. helpful. To so me, still that's the exactly. applicants would need to provide a similar level of information, and staff would need to do analysis and provide um, indicators that the board could predetermine which indicators they cared about, how successful have they been in the past in raising funds, um, how much of the money is secured at this point. I mean, different variables or indicators that would be helpful for all of you to know um, and have that kind of analysis but not a score. Is that what? You're well, I, I'm hearing both. I'm hearing uh, yes. less information and no score. Um, yes, so less. I, not I mean, no but information. some information somewhere though, in yeah. that says, yeah. do they have a plan? Have right. they, well, they, how they already had to give a it? plan. Yeah, I mean, everybody has to give a plan. So I mean, they would continue having to give a plan, but the amount of backup and detail on that plan, it sounds like, it doesn't need to be anywhere at the level we were asking. Oh, I read all and, those leverage plans, and I had a sense of who really had a plan and who who was pie in the sky right some were not very de some were not very detailed at all yeah. were less than most of the plans were fairly short you know less than a page right. in most cases right. um where others really gave that detail about how successful they've been in the past with these particular funders um others maybe just gave a list of two or three and then they would do more so there was a real variety there um mm -hmm. but i i think i hear what both Adrian and Alyssa have said in terms of having indicators but not a score that goes there because you don't necessarily agree with the weight that that staff put on different pieces of the analysis that we had done. Well, I mean, it could be wrapped into the budget section and be part of that score. I mean, we could do that. But I, I don't think it could be unscored. I don't. Nothing in our application is unscored. You know what I'm saying? If I'm asking them to give the information, that we're going to be evaluating the information. Somebody's going to be evaluating it. So I would not feel comfortable recommending that because I don't feel that's fair. Um, but I would be comfortable rolling it into another question that is also scored as a, of a piece. Okay. Because okay. um, it criteria is criteria might be, you know, is it well thought out? Do they have a track record? But not how likely is it that this private foundation or that public source is going to come through or not? That I, I well, you can again, you can do your thing on the back end or the front end. I think our effort toward evaluating plausibility is aimed at not having to take money away much down the line. I think if you have less work on the front end for that, you may be not funding some things within if the money doesn't come through. Um, but that's the entrepreneurial know. spirit, I think, of this. Well, that's fine. Fund. I mean, I it's leveraging and trying to influence, move the needle on something that you know. Oh boy, this t funding is tight, but the children's levy is going to. That's the entrepreneurial spirit, and we know that some of those groups, out of the well, how many did we fund? Nine, maybe two won't come through, and we're going to have to deal with how do we reallocate that. But we've given we think it's a priority program, and we've given them you know, a, a boost, an advantage, uh, every shot that they can get at trying to leverage that, and it's not always going to work. 
That's fine. I don't think I necessarily have an agenda one way or the other. I just it's a, it's about your own comfort level in doing that, because yeah. sometimes it's hard for people once they give somebody money to then take it away, and I think that's not as an easy thing. Mm-hmm. So I I, I don't want to underestimate that that's painful. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, um, I think we've had some good feedback, mm-hmm. food for thought, and I think the, we're saying we want something analytically less complex next time <laughs> around. I got it. Um, but I also want to, I didn't want to leave time for some public comment, but I also wanted to cover your last yeah. point about the uh, minimum and maximums of yeah. the suggestion of, of making $250,000 leverage fund grants, which are now the minimum, making that the maximum, too. Why don't you? Um, the reason we put that up there is that because that was basically what we did. Um, the eight out of the nine grants we gave were at approximately 250, and there was tremendous desire I felt coming from you all to spread the money as much as possible amongst the different groups because there were so many applications and so many well-deserving programs. And so the one advantage to making um, a minimum maximum like that is that it, you get right-sized applications. So the application that comes in is actually for something that really costs that much money as opposed to something that costs five times or four times or three times as much money, but then you cut them down to 250, which puts us in the position of having to sometimes start with scratch practically with people to renegotiate what their application is because everything they said in their application they can't really do because we gave them one you know third of the money they were planning to get does that make sense so we're, we're often starting like okay what can we do for this so we can't really hold people to their application particularly because um, we have to start again um, so I think that's not great I think I think I, especially in this situation where people sometimes ask for very large amounts of money and then got cut down and we didn't have it's not the same as when people are have been funded by us and they might ask for more but they have a current funding level so we know what they're doing right now for this much money so we know if we gave them that much money they could likely do that same thing again or you know a little more um, but when you're starting from scratch with somebody it's more difficult to figure that out and I thought there was a lot of colloquy back and forth at that meeting about well could you do this and could you do that and I think it is difficult from you all's perspective to try to judge that in the moment and I think it's difficult for the person sitting here um, to decline funding ever in this climate so those were issues that prompted me to make this you know thought I don't know would it make sense to uh, keep 250 as the grant size I don't know what people think I I, I mean I, I definitely felt the the dynamic of our meeting when we're asking organizations, can you do with less? And of course they'll say, well, yeah, we can, we can figure out how to do it with less. But, uh, so I, I like the idea personally of maybe right sizing it and just stating 250 as the minimum and maximum, but it's just my two cents. Um, I wasn't mm-hmm. there, but I've, I felt those feelings. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I'd build on Elise's entrepreneur spirit. At, if a good idea comes along that's bigger, I would rather that we be able to fund it than to cap each thing at 250. And I guess I'm not as democratic as my colleagues. I'd rather see less grants that are bigger than more grants that are smaller and really be able to say, wow, this, we really made an impact. You can see it because it was a bigger grant and more, grant, more matching came in to make a big difference in that particular area. So that's my two cents on it. Other thoughts? Um, I, I'm in agreement with Ron. I think to leave it the way it is, I, it seemed to me that the reason the 250 came is because there, there were several that were right around there, and I don't know. Eight out of nine. Yeah. No, I mean, and not in the end, in the beginning. The one of the ones we funded, they, the ones, their original request was somewhere around there. Am I? Am I wrong? It seems like the relief nursery was one that we We're, scaled back. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that we didn't uh, yeah. scale some back, but it seemed like it, it kind of fell into that pattern, and that's why it was just taking shaving a little bit off a few to make one more. I don't know that that would necessarily happen again. I think potentially we could have um, you know, several more in the four to $500,000 range that we thought were really innovative and creative and probable and demonstrable. So I, I would... I'm okay either way, but I would tend to leave it leave it the way it is. I'm I'm kind of torn because I do. I mean, it, it's one where I see I saw so many organizations apply for so much that you know then you know just looking at the pot of money that could have taken away from you know the majority of the applicants. And so I I think I agree you know with the entrepreneurial spirit. And if there is an organization that is demonstrating that they can uh, 
bring in those funds um, to match and bring you know more into our community, I am definitely for that. But I would just really emphasize to the applicants not applying for the majority of the budget as a whole. I think that was the challenge that I had when seeing some of the applications come in and like with that you're requesting almost the full budget of what we have to give. I think that was, you know, maybe just this is just a comment to the, the applicants. But I would be for um, leaving it open and for organizations to demonstrate that they would be able to leverage funds and bring in um, that amount, even if it was higher than the 250. Well, and I agree with that. I think that this is um, a case where we really tried to think this out ahead of time. What's the bare minimum to ensure that we have no more than 10 grants because there's an administrative load on the staff and yet leaving some flexibility open. But we did say in the RFI, as well as in the bidders conference, that it would be eight to 10 grants. It gave organizations a sense of how we envisioned spreading it out across the community. And I think, you know, I, I think we would be remiss if we gave two and a half, uh, two and a half million dollars to say two organizations because it gives such a bump up to those organizations to leverage a million point two five when there's a lot of different organizations that if they had a two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand dollar grant could have an opportunity as well to to leverage. So um, I thought, in the spirit of spreading that around without putting too much administrative burden the eight to 10 was really um, an appropriate amount. I still feel that way. I think any discomfort that we had in terms of, oh my gosh, you suggested a, a, a $1.2 million program and can you actually do it for something closer to 250 to 300, um, I do put back in their lap as, you know, was that in the spirit of this leverage fund after all the conversations we had about it? And if there was discomfort around that, you know, I, I guess I would look to those organizations to um, figure out, you know, how, how they justify that. I think that we came up with a good balance. Um, I actually had, by memory, so this might be wrong, three groups that went over the 250. I would not want to see a 250,000 cap. The Library Foundation was the most obvious one. They came in with a request that only put them at the same amount that they had had in a previous round. So combining the amount that we awarded them in the direct service plus a leverage fund, only gave them how much they had had in a previous but round, leverage fund. Yes, leverage fund. they had no, they were not entitled to a renewal under the leverage fund, though. Right. So I hesitate to say that because no, that gives the that. impression that people are entitled to some kind of renewal amount. No one's ever entitled to any renewal under any process. So I, I understand that. But still, it would have represented a dramatic drop in services. And I think it was appropriate, also given that they got the highest score, that we gave them the 430000 um, the Rosemary Anderson was the second highest scoring by only one point, culturally specific organization. I believe we gave them the, the whole request at 255. That was just slightly over the 250. And then Children's Relief Nursery put in a very um, thoughtful response about we can't open up a whole new service in outer southeast for the amount that you gave us. It wouldn't be responsible. We need to have a certain level in order to open up a whole new that was a compelling argument for us to bump them up. Again, we only bumped them up by, I think, 25,000. That's all we had left. But I think having the flexibility to deal on the spot is important. I think eight to 10 is the appropriate amount. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, it's been a good discussion. And let's just conclude by asking if there's any public testimony, either on the actual leverage fund process that we completed in June or on some of the discussion we've had about future guidelines. Anybody wish to testify? Come on up, just give us your name, and then you have Hello. three minutes. I'm Laura Wintergreen. I'm an advocate with the um, East Portland Action Plan. And um, as we looked at the decisions you made, we didn't get to see everything that you saw, so we're not second-guessing you. But did want to put before you, in terms of a process that we held, where we were establishing what the priorities were from the already prioritized East Portland Action Plan. So we held a session where we had parents, parenting grandparents, we had a superintendent, we had two school board members, we had over eight social service members, communities of faith, over 60 people do prioritization of projects. And two of those projects were submitted for the leveraged fund and neither got funded. 
And so for us, it was a matter where does the community have a voice in this process? And really wanted to put that forward because we felt we were very um, representative of the community and really looked at what does East Portland need, but there was not any way that we knew to interject that into your consideration in your process. And so just want you to consider that for the future, how you might integrate that into your consideration, because certainly our community members took their input very seriously and really looked at, and that included people voting against themselves, mm -hmm. sort of social service organizations saying, no, these two services are, are highly important um, So for this area. So just wanted to ask you to, to consider that. Can I ask a question? Sure. Did you um, send us written um, a letter or an email about your, the results of your um, actions that you took? Because I don't remember seeing anything. And we sent it only, um, we sent it to Commissioner Saltzman. Okay. So he had gotten that information um, as the city because it was a city process that so we had sent it there. But in the future, certainly, we're educating ourselves and our understanding that we should have broadened that to the rest of this committee. Well, I'm pretty sure anything you would have sent me, I would have made sure that staff and the other committee members got, but I, yeah. I can't recall, but if we didn't, I apologize. Well, thank you, and I want to thank you for putting together such a process to get community in, but I think that's great, and I apologize if um, things didn't turn out, but I think it was a, um, you know, I really appreciate you, the effort that you put into it. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to reiterate that, too, and when I talk about need, and that, that is such a subjective thing, but one of the things I keep going back to was the very extensive community process that the staff led before the um, ballot measure got passed again with groups like yours coming together and often voting against themselves. And, and I took that very seriously and I would have loved to have heard that and, and also invite you and representatives of community processes like that to come forward at these meetings for public comment. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else wants to address this? Come on up. Give us your name and you have three minutes. Uh, yeah, Dennis Morrow with uh, Janus Youth Programs. I wasn't planning on saying anything, but having heard your discussion, I think I would like to just offer you uh, support for the process that you have. We have at Janus now 85 different funding sources across 46 different programs at 20 different locations, and we operate in two different states. We have money from Multnomah County, the city of Portland, the state of Oregon, Clark County, Vancouver City, state of Washington, and numerous federal grants. So we probably do as much of this kind of work as anybody in the city, I believe. And I would tell you, when I, every time I come to one of your processes, I go away in a great deal of pain and agony because of what you have to go through to reach the results you deal with. We have been in processes where you only stick to points, and that rewards the organizations that have the best grant writers, frankly. Uh, we have also been in processes where points are thrown totally out the door, and that rewards people who have the best insight, information, or connections. And I think the boldness that you have to take the points, put them out as a starting point, and then to look at what the community needs and to wrestle with that in front of the public, that's what I really admire about this process. We have had times when that benefited and we have gotten money from you. We've had times when we haven't, but I've never walked away and felt like the decision was made on anything other than a very ethical ground, but also a ground where you had this representation of the governments, the private citizens, the business struggling with what's the most important thing right now. That does change, and I think it changes this week. It's going to change in six months from now. It's going to change a year from now. So there aren't really criteria you can lock in now that says a year from now we're going to come back and do it this way. I think you can get the process. The more transparent it is for us submitting it, the clearer we can be with information. What size grants do you want? What are the, some of those criteria that you are looking at? But I just want to say to me, I was, I was thinking it's like every great work of art, I think, must start in pain somewhere whether you have operas or songs or paintings or books. And uh, I always walk away. I don't feel good even when we get money because I realize there's a lot of worthy programs that don't. But I feel tremendously reinforced by the process that you have. And I just want to say thank you for doing that. And I would encourage you to keep that, that flexibility in it. I think if that goes away, the uniqueness of this, uh, this funding stream really goes away. And it's one thing that we have in this community that doesn't exist anywhere else. So thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Anybody else? Okay, well, uh, thank you all for being here, and we will, uh, we will have a meeting in September. Oh, I'm sorry, December 7th. We actually Dan, have the date. do we need to make any decision between now and then about if, if um, any of the leverage grantees don't come up with their match, how, the process by which we're going to reallocate that?
Okay. Although I did, okay. <laughs> okay. We, we did commit to stay within the applicants that applied in June, didn't we? That we're not doing it if if exactly okay okay well we'll know by this before December well before our December seventh meeting is the deadline for organizations so okay. I would just like to say one other thing since the gentleman spoke, and that is there are some of the funding um, decisions that we ha have made that there has been lots of complaints about politics or treating this or that. And so I do appreciate your comments a lot. And with no disrespect to Deborah or Dan, um, because they are elected <laughs> officials, but you know, three of us here are just volunteers. We have no vested interest in anything in any way, shape, or form. And we hold the majority and can outvote if we wanted to the two elected officials. So um, I do appreciate your comments, and, and I've always felt it has been uh, pretty transparent on the committee. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, staff. We're adjourned until December.